Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to the Scottish Parliament and to the Festival of Politics 2018. My name is Ken McIntosh. I'm the presiding officer uh, here in Hollywood, and it's uh, a delight to see so many of you here uh, this afternoon. Uh, apologies for the delay in getting everybody in, uh, but I think you'll find it's worth it. Now, before we uh, introduce our guests, um, as well as being here, and this is an interactive occasion, so you're not just here to listen, uh, much as you will be fascinated, we want you to engage with us and to give off your views. That's the whole point of the Festival of Politics, is to try and engage and hear your opinions, uh, as well as allow you to, to, to talk about politics and things that matter to you, or to listen to the politicians that matter. And we're broadcasting the, all this live on Facebook. So for those of you who are so minded, uh, if you want to go online, we're using the hashtag FOP 2018, that's Festival of Politics 2018, hashtag. Okay, good. Now, uh, I'm delighted that we are joined today by Emeritus Professor Sir Tom Devine and Professor Stana Nadadic. If I may introduce our two guests. Sir Tom Devine is an academic and historian. Born in Motherwell, he graduated from Strathclyde University in 1968 and 20 years later was made Professor of Scottish History there before becoming going on to become Deputy Principal. Sir Tom moved to Aberdeen University in 1999 and then joined the University of Edinburgh in 2006 when he was appointed to the Sir William Fraser Chair of Scottish History and Paleography. He was the head of the School of History, Classics and Archaeology and until his retirement was director of the Scottish Centre for Diaspora Studies. Sir Tom is the author or editor of more than 40 books, one of which, The Scottish Nation, became an international bestseller, and he has written more than 100 articles on topics as varied as emigration, Caribbean sl slavery, and Scotland and sectarianism. He has won major prizes for Scottish historical research and regularly contributes to both print and broadcast media, both at home and abroad. Sir Tom was appointed OBE in the 2005 New Year's Honours List, and he was knighted in the 2014 birthday honours for services to the study of Scottish history, the first scholar to be so honoured for this reason. He has just received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the UK All-Party Parliamentary Group on Archives and History, Sir Tom Devine. <laughs> oh, wait a second, I'm, I'm going to stand a first and then And Professor Stana Nedadic graduated in economic history from Strathclyde University and her PhD in the same subject from the University of Glasgow. She spent a year at the University of Stirling before moving to Edinburgh University, where she became a school graduate director from 2009 to 2012. And she is currently Professor of Social History and Cultural History at the University of Edinburgh, where her research has focused on the social, cultural and economic life of artisans and business owners, the middle ranks, gentry and professionals since the 18th century, mainly with reference to Scotland. Prior to her university studies, Professor Nadadic spent several years working as a theatrical costume maker and designer. She has a parallel interest in the material and visual cultures of the past and is director of the Passhold Research Fund, a registered charity that promotes research into textile, fashion and clothing history. Her most recent book is titled Colouring the Nation, the Turkey Red Printed Cotton Industry in Scotland. She was appointed by Royal Warrant to be a commissioner of the Royal Commission on the Ancient and Historical Monuments of Scotland. So ladies and gentlemen, Professor Stana Nenadic. So now, ladies and gentlemen, before we uh, begin our discussion, I'm going to ask Sir Tom, if he will, to introduce and to talk to us, to give us some background on his most recent work, The Scottish Clearances. Sir Tom. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, especially for those very generous introductory remarks. Um, good evening, everyone. It's, um, it's tremendous to see so many of you here, and especially to hear a, a presentation and a discussion and what is undi undeniably one of the one of the key, perhaps most controversial, certainly emotive subjects in, in Scotland's modern history, and to have the discussion in the chamber uh, of, our, of our parliament. I think it's, uh, it's a, 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 a marriage, if you like, of the topic, 
and also the environment uh, which we have here today. And also by sheer good fortune, uh, although Ken didn't mention it, um, Stana was one of my undergraduate students um, some time ago uh, at Strathclyde University, and I certainly marked her out uh, for high achievement of the type that she is now, uh, she's now uh, developed um, in uh, the last several, several, several years. And so what I'm going to do is um, to set the context in relation to this book, and then we're going to have a, a discussion and I think perhaps the most important thing of all, as the presiding officer has said, is to give you an opportunity to comment and to, um, and to question, make questions. And the most important thing of all is to buy the book at the end of it. <laughs> because at the end of it, there is actually going to be a book signing. And our intention is to make this the biggest book signing of all time. <laughs> and our security men on duty to make sure you do not get out without purchasing a volume at the extraordinarily low price of question mark, okay? Um, okay, let me try and set the context for the discussion. Um, in 1814, Sir Walter Scott published what was to become the work which set him on to global stardom, Waverley, or to 60 years since. By, by 60 years since, he meant from the Jacobite Rising of 1745-6. And he has his anonymous commentator at the very beginning of the book say, there has not been so complete a change in this country as there has been in any other state in Europe over the last, half, the last 50 years or so. This has produced a group of beings in Scotland, in this kingdom of Scotland, as different from their grandfathers as the present English are from those of the days of Queen Elizabeth I. In a nutshell, ladies and gentlemen, he captured in those sentences the sheer scale, the speed, the widespread nature of Scottish social economic transformation and indeed cultural transformation over that period. Quite simply, Scotland in 1840, 1850 was a different place from the way it had been in the uh, 1750s, 1760s. It was the time when old Scotland disappeared and modernity embraced the land. Um, and it's never the, that process of, if you like, progressive change, not all of it necessarily good, has been the condition since that period of the late 18th and 19th centuries. The motors for these, for these enormous changes were industrialization, the Scottish rate of industrialization faster than that of England, which was more or less an evolutionary process. Extraordinarily, by the census of 1851, if you look at males in, in occupations such as mining and manufacturing, there was a slight, slightly greater percentage number of those men engaged in mining and manufacturing per head of population than in England, which made Scotland by that date the most industrialized society on earth by that measure. Then massive urbanization, so that by the census of 1861, um, Scotland had more people living in towns and cities than anywhere else in Europe apart from, apart from England. But finally, and what is going to be the focus of my brief words uh, this evening, and in fact is at the very heart of the book, The Scottish Clearances, is the process of rural change, the revolution that occurred. There have been two revolutions uh, over millennia in Scottish rural society, as there have, of course, been in other uh, rural economies and societies. Um, the first was the so-called Neolithic Revolution, millennia ago, whereby human beings ceased mainly to be hunter-gatherers or fishermen um, and became farmers and breeders uh, of stock. Uh, that was a decisive break with the past. But this process that I've outlined in this volume was just as revolutionary and it occurred over a much shorter timescale as Scott's verdict, Sir Walter Scott's verdict on the speed of the process and the transformational nature of it. That process led to a huge increase 
in the productivity of land and a major, um, a major boost to the nation's food producing capacity. It had to because population was rising and also at the same time urbanisation, the number of non-food producers was increasing at the same time. If that hadn't happened, we might have faced an Irish type catastrophe in this country by the time you get to the middle decades of the 19th, middle decades of the 19th centuries. But as I outline in the volume in this book, this change came at social costs. And the social cost, the major social cost was the extraordinary dislocation that occurred throughout Scotland, not simply in one region of it. The scale of dispossession, the fact that an old peasant society where virtually everybody who'd lived outside towns and cities and even villages had some access, access to land, no matter how minuscule. Quite literally, that old world, which had existed in Scotland for God knows how long, was swept away in about 30, 40, 50, 60, 60 years. Uh, ironically enough, in Highland Scotland, especially crofting populations still continued despite the trauma that many of them had been, had been through, many of their families had been through, still held on to patches of land. In lowland Scotland and the Scottish borders, the number of tenants was cut back drastically. So you're dealing only with a tenant farming elite by the time you get to the 1820s and 1830s. The old cotter class, who were given a small areas of land in return for work at the busy seasons, of harvesting and peat cutting. And one of the arguments in the book is that they probably made up between a quarter to a third, at least in many parishes of Scotland, a quarter to a third of the population. Those of you who can trace your ancestry back directly to lowland Scots of the 17th century, there's a very good chance that, they, that you came from such cotter families. They had gone completely. I argue in the book against perhaps received wisdom that there was actually a greater extent of landlessness and a thoroughness in dispossession and clearance, even compared to the better known examples of um, Highland Scotland. And this is what I was saying to the presiding officer earlier. Um, Penguin apparently um, have been sending out a message that they have sent me up a flak jacket so that when I go north, which I'm going next week to our place in the island of Mull, I can have some degree of protection against Gallic invective and Gallic, um, Gallic opposition to some of the things I've been saying here. I, I was conscious from the very beginning because I've been thinking, reflecting, and even writing about this for about between 30 to 40 years. Uh, I hasten to add, not continuously, I've been doing other things. But I'm conscious of the fact that in this book, there is a head-on frontal challenge to some of the assumptions, the popular assumptions, and even indeed some of the theories and theses advanced by, um, by historians, my, my, my colleagues. And in order to therefore have a degree of conviction in what I'm saying, there is a greater assembly in the book or based on the book of original sources gleaned from archives, libraries, personal collections, even the, if you like, the handed down the oral traditions of the people insofar as they can be collected today in the year 2000, 2018. Um, there had to be real, real foundational strength in terms of the evidential base, so that the generalizations and conclusions that I've, I've reached could not simply be discarded. Um, history is a, about, in a sense, you could say, continuous argumentation. So it doesn't necessarily mean that this volume claims in any way to be definitive. But what it does do is it's my honest, impartial, um, but also creative response to the evidence that I've looked at. I approached the subject with an open mind. Obviously, hypotheses started to emerge. And then, of course, the evidential base started to be shaped. Um, so this is, uh, this is what I believe to have happened. And we await the reviews, we await your questions, and of course we await the comments uh, from our, our distinguished, uh, the distinguished uh, members of the, of the panel. Um, but remember, the vital reason why you're here is to do something at the end. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Tom. And uh, now, um, Stan, if I can turn to you, uh, this is a, a, an area that you know well yourself. Your own book, um, Lyrids and Luxury, looked at uh, part of this. So as an 18th century historian, as somebody who has a, had the opportunity to read the book mm -hmm. and heard Tom's remarks, what, what, did it chime with your own view? Well, I mean, it's, it's very hard to um, say anything about a book like this which is not part of my own long intellectual genesis as a historian of Scotland, starting as a student of Tom Devine. So Tom Devine's work has obviously shaped uh, the way I've seen many things. Uh, Tom probably doesn't know, doesn't perhaps uh, know this, but I started as a student of English literature and uh, found myself, in common with many undergraduate students, I think, when they start their degrees, after a couple of weeks thinking, why am I doing this degree? And economic history was my outside subject. And I was really astonished by how um, vivid it was, uh, what an amazing department it was that Tom was part of those days. And the history of Scotland was new to me. So. Um, you didn't just buy the book, you bought the whole career. I bought the package, I bought the career, you know, and it served me very well indeed. Um, yes, I, I wrote a book, I mean, it's well over 10 years ago since I wrote about the Highland Gentry. Um, but the, 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 the story of the Highland Gentry in the period that I looked at, is this, it's the other side of the coin that's explored in this uh, book. And of course, I was absolutely delighted that Tom asked me if I'd speak at this event and be uh, part of this event, because... Um, a book like this is only something that can be produced after long reflection on the subject. Um, it is the product of, of decades of assimilating such a wide range of understanding of the sources and the other scholars that have worked on the subject. And um, I think what you see in this book is not just a real engagement, obviously, with the Highlands, though I suspect that's the area that most people will want to gravitate towards because that's where the controversy is. Um, but it, it's an engagement with the other side of clearance, which is the lowland experience, which Tom has been the historian of for many, many years. And of course, Tom might well have um, uh, taken it into the, the north of England. I, I, I come from the north of England. Um, and there is much of a similar experience to what you saw in the borders going on in, um, in the north of England as well. And uh, as I was reading the book and reading it the way in which there is an, um, an engagement with some of the myths, some of the passionately held beliefs, I mean, going back to the 18th century, um, visceral understanding of what clearance means, um, then I was trying to think, you know, Tom was exploring what, where is the... Where's the protest in other parts of Scotland? Is it there? And I likewise was thinking, where's the protest in England? Because much of that experience, and perhaps not the Gaelic dimension, but um, some of that experience is there. And I think you did mention the southeast of England, the degree to which the kind of poverty and the desperate other side of the coin of agricultural um, uh, monoculture, grain production, gave rise to um, astonishing levels of despair in the early part of the 19th century. And it's understood, but it's not understood in the way that, say, uh, the Highlands situation is understood. And I was also thinking about um, protests through poetry, people like John Clare, the peasant poet, um, living in um, uh, Lincolnshire, writing about rural change and agricultural change, and in a very, very passionate way, but a sort of single voice. So addressing these complex layers of understanding um, through a book like this, I think is very important and is probably very timely as well. Um, so Tom has given us something really to think about. But the work that I've done, <coughs> not only on um, the Highland Gentry, but on other aspects of movement, like the movement to London, so I wrote on Scots in London in the 18th century, um, is the other side of the coin that's been explored here. Okay, we'll come back, uh, if I can, to um, whether the depiction of the behaviour of the landlords, the layers, the gentry uh, in popular mythology or popular memory is, is accurate too. But if I can, Tom, just pick you up. So what you're seeing, uh, you're seeing several things in this book, um, including that it wasn't just the highlands that were cleared, it was the lowlands that were cleared. But, yes. but the popular mythology, the view that is uh, perhaps shared by many of us here today about the highland clearances is wrong. What, 
I, I've heard that from other historians too, but why have we got, how has it become so established in popular culture that here we have people, you know, driven from the land, um, you know, by evil landlords uh, to make way for, for, for sheep and driven out to the Americas or wherever else. How, how is that, you know, uh, when actually it was perhaps the product of many other things, including, you know, agrarian revolution. How come that has become such an established fact, if we may call it that, or certainly a myth? Uh, well, I mean, if, if you're referring to the Highland experience, where, it's, where it resonates, resonates powerfully, um, and it doesn't simply resonate in the consciousness of people historically, I truly believe that the Highland clearances, so-called, has become actually part of, um, of Scottish culture, part of our um, kind of sense of memory of, of where we came from. I mean, arguably, it's the most famous or infamous subject in modern Scottish history um, in terms of people's reaction to it. Uh, they may not necessarily know about it in detail, but there's a sense I mean, as we were discussing just before we came on uh, into, the, into the chamber, um, one of your parliamentary colleagues the other day referred to Brexit as possibly the source of another, another Highland clearance. Um, uh, and as there are a lot of metaphors like that which are used or similes or parallels drawn. So there's absolutely no doubt about it in terms of the folk memory of that period coming right down to the present day there's a sense that dispossession was uniquely and specifically Highland. There's a number of reasons for it, and I explore the reasons in, 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 in the book, because I find the, the kind of tension between uh, what people believe, mythology that is, and the actual um, evidence, the, the evidence that's come through, um, which of course as a research historian, I've had the time to look at, but others, others can, cannot. So, it's a fascinating area to explain why, given you know, this, this truly enormous gulf often between the realities as the documentary historian discovers them and what people believe uh, really in terms of a, a kind of social cultural uh, sense, uh, set, uh, set of assumptions. There's a number of reasons. Don't, let, don't let's forget the extraordinary allure of the Scottish Highlands. In the book, for example, I talk about, over the last 30 years, the number of monographs produced, academic monographs. These are not popular books. These are serious academic uh, analyses uh, compared to the number of books produced on the rural lowlands. It's something like somewhere in the early 40s, including Stana's book, um, in the rural lowlands, it's three or four. Uh, that's the Cinderella, if you like, of... Uh, modern Scottish historical studies. And so therefore there's a glamour, and it seems insane to say this given the suffering that people experience there, but there is a seduction about Highland Scotland which almost would require a psychologist to explain. It's partly the scenery, it's partly the, the romance of clanship, one of the reasons why this new Outlander series has been so popular uh, throughout the English-speaking world and perhaps beyond is for one reason anyway, it's set on that extraordinary place of world-class scenic beauty. And then of course the other element in it has been the way in which from, unlike again rural lowland Scotland, from the middle decades of the 19th century right through until the 1960s, 1970s, the suffering of the Highland people has been displayed politically and also by uh, writers, painters, artists, politicians, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, a high profile has been given to the Highland, the Highland experience uh, throughout that period. And finally, of course, given the imprimatur uh, in the very readable prose of um, John Preble in his book, The Highland Clearances. Not many of you will know, for example, that it is the best, biggest selling history book that is Scottish historical history book of all time. It has sold something of the order of 260,000 copies. Um, my my, um, my uh, 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 publisher is the same, Penguin, and I recall uh, my editor, and I've now, this is the fifth book I've done with him since the Scottish Nation over the 1990s, and he's saying, well, one of the reasons we agreed to do it, uh, Tom, is because of Preble's extraordinary success because they thought maybe they would have another 
another um, quote bestseller on, on their hands, unquote. Um, because Preble, uh, Preble is a, a wordsmith, or was, he's no longer with us. He knows how to write fluently. He knows how to engage people. He also writes in terms of what I call faction. That is, it's not ab absolutely true. It's not, sorry, it's not absolutely clear what is entirely based on documentary evidence and what is not, uh, because the, the piece is, was, the, the stuff he wrote is, is, is by and large not references, re referenced or footnoted. But it's a very easy read. And um, uh, my, my own volume is, is up there at, to some degree in the uh, Amazon bestsellers list at the moment. But down in Scottish history bestsellers at number 17, waiting to attack, if you like, keeping the powder dry is John Preble's The Highland Clearances. It's still selling well, and it portrays what happened in Highland Scotland as a struggle between good and evil. The, um, the greedy landlords who had prostituted their role as clan chiefs and the poor peasantry um, who had been betrayed by them. It's almost a morality tale, and that does powerfully appeal to people. But you're, you're not denying that there were cases. I mean, oh, the, no, the, no, no. The, the, so the, the, the stories of Patrick Sellers, the, the factors of the Duke of Sutherland. Not at all. Uh, the, the, the thing, um, there's two aspects to then what you go on to. First of all, I'm not in any sense denying the incidence of clearance. Of course, there was massive clearance in the Scottish Highlands. Um, but what I'm trying to say is there's been a, a terrible imbalance. Uh, it's not very well known, just to give you one example that clearance started in the Scottish borders, the western and central borders, the removal of people for stock rearing to make large park for cattle and then eventually large sheep farms. It started in the 1660s, 1670s. That was a full century before the Highland clearances. And ironically enough, the beasts, especially the great Cheviot breed, the flock masters who had grown, started to grow wealthy over the previous century, before the middle decades of the 18th century, um, on sheep farming and cattle ranching in the borders. In other words, the entrepreneurs of new sheep farming in the highlands were people who migrated north. So in a sense, curiously enough, the highland experience uh, was incubated in the southern uplands long before large-scale sheep farming of that type began to penetrate Gildom. So in, in no way, if, if, you, if people read the book, will you see any attempt to downgrade clearance in the Highlands. That there is an attempt to say that this was a pan-Scottish development, and that's why the book is called The Scottish Clearances. So, Stan, I'll just turn to you. The part of the um, popular assumptions about the clearances is that the, the landowning classes themselves, either the clan chiefs or the lairds or the... Uh, the gentry, um, were more concerned with their own conspicuous consumption mm -hmm. than they were the, the fate of their tenants or their clansmen and women. It, is that the case that you found when you published your work? Basically, yes. <laughs> so, so they spent their time here in Edinburgh? And the yes, yes. But, uh, but, it, but the... the key to my study is this is a kind of narrative that the Highland gentry were more interested in their own family or their own consumption or their own income than they were on their, uh, the people that lived on their estates. So what I sought to do in that book, though that wasn't the point of departure of the book, the, 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 the point of departure about writing about the Highland gentry was really to explore the concept of luxury. So luxury is a very important 18th century economic idea, and it's a, a basically uh, founded on the notion that one of the ways in which you get the economy going is by cultivating consumption. So that's an 18th century idea. And it was replicated across Great Britain. The luxury trap. The luxury trap, yes, it is a, a trap. And there are, you know, people like Adam Smith spoke about this and the moral implications of excessive consumption. And one can spend a lot of time talking about how the economists balance these moral imperatives around an economic necessity. The gentry, the Scottish Highland gentry, were no more than part of a bigger gentry population who had to kind of balance that with 
the utilization of their land, the demands of their families, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they got trapped into this business of making money and consuming. So one of the things that they do, and we know they do this in very large measure, uh, and they do it partly to reconcile the fact that the land that they own is a relatively poor resource. You can only do, do so much with that part of Britain. Um, they start to look for other devices to make money for the family. And one of the commonest is sending sons into the army. So that's great because you can, if you don't get killed, you can make money out of the army. And also because of the way of um, uh, peopling regiments in the 18th century, you take your regimental cohorts from the men that live on your land. So that is how all regiments are raised. Um, so at one level, you're serving a particular kind of agenda that feeds into clanship. So it kind of perpetuates ideas of clanship. But at another, you're taking key members of prominent landowning families into a professional world that is inherently luxurious and reckless and um, has less and less regard for the land. So one vanity of the, fair. It is vanity fair, absolutely. If you send your second son into the army, your son goes age 15. He knows nothing about how to run an estate. If your eldest son dies, and he's been trained as a lawyer because the best skill you have for running a state in the 18th century is the legal training. If that army officer inherits the land, he hasn't a clue what to do with it. All he sees is a resource to take money out of it. So it becomes a kind of vicious circle that inevitably either leads to bankruptcy, and many of these families go bankrupt long before they can clear the land, which means somebody else buys the estate and they have less connection to the people who live there. Or it leads to sales and many of these estates are sold, and they become residents in Edinburgh. Mm. And the other dynamic is women, who are no longer uh, elite women, gentry women, who are not part of the productive life of an estate anymore. They cultivate a kind of gentility. They expect to live on annuities. So the kind of burden on estates is just going up and up and up. And uh, inevitably, yes, they do I give think rise to clearances. I think one of the things uh, that's uh, perhaps lurking behind all this is the, the extraordinary um, boom which starts about the mid-18th century and is still going on to the, through to the end of the 19th century, and that is rising population. Mm. Um, when I worked um, a number of years ago in Scotland and Empire, um, I was trying to understand why the Scots, especially male Scots, um, not least military Scots of the type that Stana has described, uh, made such an impact on, on, um, uh, on uh, empire because disproportionately the statistical evidence suggests that they did. Mm. It's not simply a, a, a Scotch myth, if you, if you will. Um, but but, the, th but the, thing, the thing was that uh, I came across example after example of landed gentry in Scotland, not simply in the Highlands, but across the whole country. And of course, it was exactly the same in England because they were going through the same population revolution of having 10, 11, 12, 13 sons. What do you do with them if you're a member of an elite? Because th there's not simply a concern to make sure they're employed and they can earn their own living, but there's also a concern to retain uh, that in that kind of group psychology, gentility. And, and you know, the, the, the fear that they will fall down and engage in downward social mobility to the dishonor of the family, so the, the, the population factor, together with what Stana has described as the luxury trap, it's almost like a, it's almost like a, a, a device coming together and crushing them. Now, in the book, I tried to discuss the very, the vital point about will and subjectivity. Did these people who indulged in some of these activities, like clearance, um, which seems to us in this period, of course, so odious? Did they have a choice? Or were the forces so powerful that they were, it was going to happen, it was going to happen anyway? Because I do come across some examples of people resisting clearance and then only finally agreeing with their factors to do it when they were close to bankruptcy. And of course, in the book and elsewhere in the historiography is the clear evidence that the worst clearers of all were not um, the, uh, the gentry uh, were not the descendants, if you like, of the clan gentry, 
but were lowland trustees who were brought in when an estate went bankrupt and which and who in law, in strict legal rigor, their role was to make sure the estate was rebalanced, its debts paid off, so that it could be sold for the benefit of creditors. That had awesome effects on the people on, that, on those estates mm -hmm. because by the time you get to the 1820s, 1830s, 40s, the only viable source of income for some of those highland lands was sheep farming, mm -hmm. with the usual implications. I've got a number of other questions for you, but uh, can I just ask the audience, if you do wish to catch, catch my eye or ask a question, please just put your hand up and I'll do so. Um, the, the gentry themselves, I actually thought you were the clan chiefs, um, and you, I thought you were relatively sympathetic to them because you were saying that they weren't so much lured by the, the flesh pots of Edinburgh, whatever you call the capital mm. of those days, as they were forced to go because they had to appear before courts. Um, and they uh, that, was, that was much earlier. That was uh, in the 17th century. That, that was part of what I call the growing encroachment of the state. Mm -hmm. You see, the clan, and if you want to simplify this, the clan system grew up in the early medieval Scotland. Um, and clan-type structures were across Scotland in this period, and they lived on to some degree in the Scottish borders, but much longer in the areas where the state had limited control. The essential rationale for clanship, eventually, of course, it was, it was bolted together by loyalty, by, by tradition, by centuries of relationships between kindred or so-called kindred, but its original rationale was people were looking for protection from great men in periods of instability when the state couldn't guarantee it. So therefore, the, 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 as the state becomes stronger in these areas, clanship type structures start to decay. And the point you're making, Ken, was in the 17th century, uh, late 16th, early 17th century, the Scottish state, partly because of the union with uh, England in 1603, the Regal Union, began to flex its muscles more. And you see the steady ebbing away um, of uh, clan structures, but they don't disappear. Because if they did disappear by 1745, six, you wouldn't have had the capacity to call out men, many of whom joined the, um, not only the Jacobite army, but also through the, um, the, 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 the various cadet branches of Clan Campbell, the Hanoverian army, army as well. So what you're addressing is something that did happen um, and the landowners or the clan chiefs or the clan gentry at that time uh, had no alternative but to appear in court, no alternative but to attend uh, in Edinburgh, sometimes even to be fined. And of course, one of the results of that was increasing cost and increasing cost started to finally result in increasing rentals and so you began to see a kind of landlord mentality, a commercial landlord mentality, um, developing out of the old um, kindred, the old concern for, for kindred. And you see, therefore, in the part of the chiefs, the decay of that almost untranslatable term, duchus in Gaelic, which essentially means, from the people's point of view, that they have given blood service uh, for perhaps generations to the elite families. Uh, they've also had to pay rental. And in, in return for that, they wish to have guaranteed protection within, from the elite within the bounds of the clan. And that is why, unlike the position south of the Highland Line, clearance was the worst possible violation of that particular contract. It wasn't a legal contract. It was much more important and significant than that. It was a kind of bond in blood. And as Stan and Edith has just said a few minutes ago, what you get after Culloden is not the removal of those bonds. You get almost a kind of renewal of them because the Highland gentry start to become military entrepreneurs. They build up Highland regiments and in a sense negotiate with the British state to employ them during these great wars of the Seven Years' War, the American War of Independence, and the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. And in, you know, recall particularly some papers I looked at in Armadale Castle and Sky, the MacDonald uh, papers there, um, lands given in return for sons. Lands given in return for sons. In other words, the agreement was 
or so the people thought, that in return for the males of the family enrolling in the family regiment of the elites or the landed class at that time, which was perhaps more important than relevant to say, that there was a guarantee of possession and land. Uh, there's obviously, as you can tell it from some of the evidence given and also from some of the oral traditions of the time, that the people honestly believed that that guaranteed them continued and perhaps even perpetual uh, possession of land. And that is why when that sacred bond, in a sense a blood bond, because it was quite commonplace for uh, husbands and sons to die abroad, not necessarily through combat, but through disease, um, that was remembered. And that had a, an effect on the societal attitude in a way that removal in lowland Scotland didn't have to the same extent. Mm -hmm. Because in lowland Scotland, it had been agreed for generations that if a tenant came to the end of term, the landlord had a perfect legal right to remove them, or at least not to renew the tenancy and bring in somebody who was perhaps more skilled and able to pay a higher rental. Mm -hmm. That was a legal con uh, construct, whereas in Gildom, and especially in the Western Highlands and Islands, uh, there was a quite different connection. Mm -hmm. And that is again one reason to answer your earlier question, Ken, why in a sense the, the impact, the psychological impact on the, uh, the collective attitudes of the people it was more profound than anywhere else in Scotland. And, and I, I should say that there were, you know, many people amongst the Highland gentry could see what was happening, but it is kind of relentless. And I recall reading some of the papers of the Malcolms of Poltalla, mm. and Malcolm slave, of owners. slave owners. That's right. So the estate owner was a Jamaica slave owner mm -hmm. living in London, fantastically wealthy yeah. merchant, sending he money back to the estate. Yeah, standards. absolutely. Yeah. His younger brother lived on the estate and ran the estate and he's writing letters to his older brother saying the people would like you to come and live amongst us we want you to live here he's writing back saying I can't you know I'm making big money here I'll be back next year or five years time and it is you know people could see the writing on the wall that the the the, the kind of pressures are relentless to undermine the system now I want to ask a question about the the the, the physical scars that the okay. The, the clearances have left because I thought I, I, actually one of the things I liked about your book called I liked a lot about your book but it was um, talking about the bringing the, the the life that the people lived on the land and um, those that were in many ways invisible to us because they weren't registered but you talked in particular I think about the lowlands in the lowlands that um, that the cotters they they actually lived in houses that were pretty well uh, uh, recycled yes. how you put it and and when they when they were moved around and they were moved around a lot. Yep. So although they had a link to the land, it was a different bit of land. Yes. They'd actually take their door and their roof beams with them. Yes, well, particularly the, the roof um, the roof timbers. Yes. Uh, they were, I mean, not only in lowland Scotland, right across Scotland, that was the most valuable part of the, of the house. And one of the things you do find during clearance that normally the people would be allowed to take them away because my, my, my reckoning, and it's, I try to demonstrate it in the volume, is that in the first instance, uh, in Highland Scotland, the process was one of resettlement in the later 18th century. Uh, what, 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 the, what was known at the time was crowding in. That is, people who were moved out of a particular area were moved into another township, which of course, you know, therefore the land was, was cut up, the land was divided. In lowland Scotland, the pattern was slightly different. There's this remarkable proliferation of village development. Mm. And so you find the former, the former cotters, uh, they don't all emigrate to America or to the towns. They're kind of relocated in this mushrooming of village development. Because in the early period, Ken, in the early period of industrialization, much of the textile activity and other forms of handicraft activity took place in rural villages, not in the big cities. Mm. Uh, so there was the possibility of, re of re redeploying them. Uh, but the big, the big difference in my view, um, which is one of the reasons I got interested in this when I started to research a book called The Great Highland Famine in the 1980s, um, is, and I always tell the children this when we go up there and now the grandchildren, 
look for the marks on the land, because, you know, our place in Mull, um, where you can see the Fenican, that is the cultivation beds, when the bracken's down. People have gone, but those raised sandwiches of soil um, are still to be seen all over the area. In a, in a parish which today has no permanent resident, but had 450 at the census of, 18, of 1841. Uh, and equally, um, of course, there's the ruins. Uh, not everywhere, but one of the most emotive things of going to places, if you know where to go, is to see the former, uh, the former townships. Um, uh, obviously incomplete, because to go back to your word recycling, a lot of the dry stained dikes, the new farmhouses which were built, were constructed out of the stone uh, that were originally part of um, uh, the, dwelling of a, the dwelling of a family. Um, so the, the, the thing about the Western Highlands and Islands, or at least parts of that area, what happened is still visible on the land. In lowland Scotland and border Scotland, it's vanished. Um, there is, again, the recycling process took place with the building uh, materials, particularly stone, being used for other purposes. But partly because it happened earlier than what happened in the Highlands, um, you, would be, you would have great difficulty. It's not entirely impossible, especially in some of the river valleys of the borders, but you would have difficulty getting that kind of iconic archaeology which makes visits to certain parts of the Highlands so extraordinarily remarkable. Um, you know, to see these places in, in locations of aching scenic beauty. Mm -hmm. And the thing that's missing, of course, are the roofs, because they were always taken off, because they, if you didn't do that, then the landowner was have to continue to pay rates. And of course, above all, the people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I you don't get that sense in Lowland Scotland, which is, and again, one of the reasons for the amnesia. Mm. And, and the romanticism, perhaps. I know the, the very place I'm from in the Isle of Skye, yes. uh, the, the village of Elgol, yes. which is at the end of the Strathair Peninsula. Correct. Six miles down, there's a, a village called Sushnish, yes. which is still there, an entirely cleared village. And Borrowrig. And Borrowrig, yes, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, again, put your hand up if you want to come in here and, and, and ask a question. Uh, there's another theme that runs in your book, and I don't know if you want to come in with Stana too, which is um, there's a difference between the people of the lowlands and the highlands too. Um, the, the, the people of the highlands are Celt, they're speaking Gaelic. Yes. But what's interesting in your book, you're talking about both um, this growing romanticism. So you, you start off actually talking about the highlands as a, as a pretty miserable, uh, bleak, gloomy, desperate place to live. But then after... Stevenson and others and various diarists come, it, it changes and it becomes this, ro this romantic allure builds up. But at the same time this is happening, the Celts themselves, the Gaels, yes. are really, I mean, you, you call it racism, I mean, they, they, are, they are looked down upon. Oh yes, I mean, by the, the time, by the time you get to the middle decades of the 19th century, you've got this extraordinary duality of the romantic vision of the Highlands Scott, of course, being quite influential in that, but there are a number of other reasons. Uh, the Highlands is a romantic place, um, but at the same time, in other quarters, in other social strata in the lowlands, there is the beginnings of vicious racism. Um, the notion that the Teuton, uh, that is the lowland Scot mainly, and those from the Northern Isles, the Teuton is much superior uh, to the Celt. I mean, there's this extraordinary um, analysis that's drawn. The, the Celt has been pushed because of racial inadequacy from uh, Europe to Ireland and to the maritime areas and the insular districts of the Scottish Highlands. This is a reflection, so some of these individuals who are unde undeniably racialist authors, um, this is the, the conclusion they drew about why people lived in Ireland and the Western Highlands and Islands. And this comes out very clearly uh, during some of the attempts to provide charity for the people of the Highlands during the Great Potato Famine of the 1840s, early 1850s. Um, the, the big, uh, the, 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 if you like, the intellectual and bureaucratic boss of much of the charitable activity and especially government activity was one Sir Charles Trevelyan, 
and his, his edict uh, was, we must prevent the leprosy of Ireland, that is the poverty and famine uh, crisis in Ireland, from crossing the, crossing the Irish Sea. And in order to avoid that, he said, we'll have to get rid of at least 40,000 of these inadequate Celts and bring in their replacement, and this is spelt out clearly in the book, 40,000 Germans, because they can be guaranteed not only to have the superior intellect, but the work ethic that these inadequates, the, the work ethic that these indolents do not have. Because that mindset uh, articulated the view that the reason why in the, the richest society on the planet, Aka, Great Britain at that time, that there was actually a famine, people you know, were potentially starving, must be because of their own collective fault. Uh, and and, and this, th this, um, this sentiment was extremely important. One of the things, again, if you talk about the marks on the land of the time, um, the area uh, is covered with tracks, destitution roads, by which famished people um, were given one pound, a one pound of meal per day in order to earn their corn through working. Um, because the ethic of the time was, uh, and this, you know, but dealing with people who are suffering severe and acute food shortage, the ethic of the time was that um, if we allow them free food, that will further demoralize them, in other words, will affect their character, mm -hmm. and there'll be no recovery. Uh, so it, it's, um, it's a bitter about, period. We, we, we're having the same debates in politics today, as I'm sure you're aware. Uh, so it's but it is worth saying that this idea of there being, that wasn't thought, that's, this isn't how the Highlands were viewed in the 18th century. No, no. There's very much the idea the noble savage yeah. was, you know, the Gallic race, the Ossian. This is something that reaches its peak. But it's a kind of Victorian, because is, if yeah. you look at... These ideas are, are applied in different ways in inner city London, the idea of the residuum, that That's the right. poor are kind of a, an entrenched group whose poverty is their own. I mean, it's interesting to, if you look at the newspapers who, were, who had this at the very heart of their editorials. Two of them exist to this day. Mm. The one that's now called the Herald, rather than the Glasgow Herald, and the Scotsman. Uh, and there was another, the John O'Groats Journal, which is no longer, no longer with us. Um, and the Inverness, there were two, uh, two Inverness papers. One of us was very much pro-people. The other was bitterly racist uh, in, in, its, in its attitude. Um, so that then explains, Ken, why by the time you get to the 1840s, 1850s, you get some of the most draconian clearances mm -hmm. um, in the Highlands because the, the uh, people who managed these processes in a way which didn't happen in the earlier period um, thought these people were almost subhuman and they could be treated in a certain way, which of course never happened at all in that particular way in lowland Scotland. So again, the wound was deeper. The wound was deeper and more penetrating and the collective memory um, in a peasant-based society remembers it. I mean, one of my favorite um, one-liners, if you like, uh, uh, from the history of peasantries in Europe uh, the great French historian Pierre Joubert, who wrote a mammoth work on the peasantry of the Bouvet and the Bouvisie uh, in, uh, in France. Um, no peasant willingly gives up his land, be it only half a furrow. So therefore, you had this extraordinary, almost epical, uh, uh, epic conflict between the values of these, these, these racist thinkers, I think strongly influenced eventually by Darwin, you know, the survival of the fittest. Um, and on the, one, on the other hand, this ethic of the people who, despite the fact they seemed to be living in depressed poverty, were still wanting to cling to that patch, that patch of land. I've got a couple of contributors here who to come in. First of all, the gentleman there with the microphone, and Could, then there's another gentleman up here. I don't know whether this is working or not. It is, we can hear you. Thank you. Um, could you mention cultural differences the main one, of course, being that the two, two parts of Scotland spoke a different language from, it, from each other, and that must have made the Highlanders more remote and more isolated than they otherwise would have been if they could understand each other. And then, of course, they only got the, the, the translation of the Bible fairly late. 
And so culturally, they were in limbo almost. Well, of course, this, this, this helps to explain again um, these, if you like, this, these differentiated attitudes. Stan has talked about the, the view of the kind of 18th century view of the noble savage. Uh, then you get the kind of uh, uh, early 19th century view of the Highlander as warrior because of the Highland regiments and the tremendous pride that they had instilled in Scotland because of their prowess uh, on the field of battle, not least, of course, at, uh, at Waterloo. Um, but then, partly because of this devastating failure of society, you get the, the third differentiating thing, and of course an important differentiator, is language. So it's quite easy to see these people as alien and different. And it's not all that far when you get to a catastrophe, as you had in the, 18, the 1840s and 1850s, to think of them as different in other ways as well. That not, they're not really the same as us. Um, that is, um, this, is the, this is the view of certain members of the educated middle classes and to a degree upper classes in lowland Scotland. I'm not painting with a broad brush. That's not necessarily the view of everyone, but it was certainly the view of some influential people. And unfortunately for the people of the Highlands in particular, these influential people were at the heart of the charitable activities that took place uh, during that crisis. So yes, you know, the sense of difference, the sense of the other may also have been affected in lowland Scotland by the fact that they spoke a different dialect, sorry, a different language. Can I, before I bring the gentleman in here, would, you, would it be fair to see you can see the traces of that uh, in attitudes to Gaelic today? I mean, even today in Scotland, although the Scottish Parliament has passed yes. a, a Gaelic Language Act to try and stabilise the language and recognise its authenticity, there is, there is clear hostility still to Gaelic in many parts of yes. Scotland. These things don't vanish um, very readily, and especially if there's a sense of the other, and especially if the other is a minority and struggling to assert its, um, its sense of identity. It's not surprising that there are elements among the majority, especially if it involves taxation and funding, uh, who are going to feel it this can. Mm. I bring the jet, by the way, Which I'm, is a I'm, great pity. I'm trying to bring out, my, my computer's crashed, typically, okay. isn't it? Trying to bring in the Facebook audience here. Gentlemen, up right at the back there. Okay. Uh, can I just thank Professor Devine uh, for wonderful, uh, comprehensive, which sounds to me like a comprehensive treatment in a great book. Um, I'm a geographer, so I venture into history a little bit with some trepidation. Uh, you, uh, you began it by, by asking, but by saying, why is there is this imbalance between what happened in the Lowlands and what happened in the Highlands? And you made it sound initially a bit puzzling, but since then you've given all kinds of explanations, the landscape, the culture, the re you know, and so on. Could I just suggest maybe one small, uh, well, two small further factors, that so many of the, uh, well, in, in some cases, the people cleared off the land in the highlands uh, went to Canada as communities and settled in Canada as communities, and they remembered as a community <laughs> what had happened to them. And uh, so you can find some monuments, for instance, the island of Arran, to clearance, clearances that happened there, put up by Canadians. So then, of course, maybe an obvious thing, th these traumatic things in the Highlands happened when there were more, uh, there were newspapers, there were reporters, there were journalists who could, and people to observe how horrible it was, it was in some cases. Um, and then maybe um, a, another perhaps less tangible thing, I'm rather speculative, um, the <clears throat> well-recognized symbols of Scotland, tartan, bagpipes, whiskey, and so on, really come out of the Gaelic culture. And that, in some ways, tends to er 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 erase lowland culture to some extent. It gets played down out, you know, outside Scotland. And <clears throat> but, of course, the, the Highlanders migrating to the the in industries and cities in the, in the lowlands took the culture with them, and that so perhaps helps to explain. But why that we have these as our national symbols? But um, okay, it's okay. Uh, can I ask you, it, sir, because it, so in, in Parliament you only get one question. You're already okay. into your third, okay. I think. So well, okay. these are just some uh, comments. I mean, Thank you. Uh, 
the interesting thing was you, you, you actually made a set of comments rather than questions, and all I can say to you is, in great detail, all of them are in the book. So, um, <laughs> if, 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 you want, if you want the evidential base, as I keep calling it, for your, um, your, your arguments, then you'll, you'll find it a plenty in there. There's just one last thing I would like to say about, well, I call, I call it Highlandism. You've called it tartanry. Um, and uh, let's face it, um, the, the world that I'm talking about, and it's not, it's not the world as existed, it's what I call designer Highlandism. You know, the stuff that people wear in Burns nights and at weddings, etc. In fact, I actually called it in a recent work I did, Neo-Highlandism. Because in the 50s, I don't know if you, any, either of you can remember this, but I can. In the 1950s, early 1960s, it used to be said that only members of the armed forces and Tory, uh, Tory gentlemen walking down Princess Street wore kilts. And now it's everywhere, at weddings and graduation ceremonies. Uh, I don't see it as often yet at funerals, but it's coming. <laughs> because there is something extraordinarily seductive about Highlandism. Uh, my last graduate student, uh, a Swiss-German called um, David Hesse, he's now a senior figure in one of uh, Zurich's biggest newspapers. He produced a thesis, and it's now in a book called Warrior Dreams. And it's about this extraordinary thing, this craze that exists between uh, Moscow and Stockholm uh, of people dressing up as Highlanders. Um, uh, uh, the pipe bands, military enactments, um, all sorts of uh, related activities. None of them have ever been to Scotland. Uh, none of them have any Scottish blood. Uh, he counted something of the order of 3,800 of these spectacular events which were going on. Interestingly enough, none of them in the Mediterranean areas. It was all Northern Europe. He's even, he even came up with the bizarre conclusion until he verified it with this, the historian's uh, great asset of reference to evidence, namely that Bavaria was an obsessive center of this cult because Hitlerism had destroyed traditional German folk culture in that part of Germany, so they had adopted Highlandism uh, as, uh, as an alternative set of mythologies. And this is why, eventually, ladies and gentlemen, I came to the conclusion that not only did I require a sociologist as part of the um, supervisory team uh, for David, but also a psychiatrist. Um, you know, it was just, it was beyond the, sorry to use the word Ken, Ken, yeah, but Ken, it was beyond the Ken of a mere historian why this is. And so if you then go back to Scotland, to Scotia, what we have done, we have adopted a form of sartorial nationalism. Uh, one of the great assets, of course, of advantages of that in terms of visitor attraction is we have now have probably the most globally recognized national dress, dress of any ethnicity in the world. And of course, this was building up uh, in the late 18th, early 19th centuries at the same time as the real Highlands society, not the designer Highlands, uh, was being torn apart by eviction, by destitution, by the failure of various economic activities uh, and not least by famine. Uh, I have a great lover, in terms of my trade, a great lover of paradox, uh, problem, um, uh, puzzle. This is one of the reasons why we have such a wonderful laboratory for studying the human past in a manageable context as Scotland. Mm -hmm. This is why we are envied by historians throughout Europe, because there's so many aspects to our history that are part of some of the great themes of historiography. But because we're relatively small sized, because we've got only a relatively small population, doing that in terms of what the French call histoire totale, total history, is manageable. In a way which is very difficult, for example, in Russia, very difficult in the USA, but we can manage it. And that, that is why, that is one of the reasons why uh, a, a, a semi-witty journalist a couple of years ago called Scottish Historical Studies, the new rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> Stan, I like to be, this is actually an area, 
well, certainly textiles and development and design in Scotland is, is an area of, of your expertise and speciality. Mm -hmm. Did, uh, I think most of us think of, of the tartanisation of Scotland as being a relatively new phenomenon, that the, the Celtic Highlanders didn't actually go around in, in kilts the way that we... No, of course not, because they, they, they couldn't have made that kind of fabric <laughs> uh, in, in peasant society. It, it is an early 19th century lowland industrial manufacture. Uh, and very successful, yeah. Um, the Wilson's big firm was, was in Bannet, 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 yes, the big yes. firm. Largely supplying the military, actually. Yes. That's the big market, is the military market. I can see a lady right there. Now, if you just, yes, the, the microphone on your desk, if you put your hand up, they'll put, a mic, they'll put the microphone on your desk on. There we are, yes. Yes. That's good. Because that's the way they speak to you in Parliament. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the, and, and uh, that's why you can control them. Yes, and, and the, because and you just turn it off. And they, they often answer by saying, I can't answer that now, but I've got a book outside. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. Um, from my studies of Scottish history in the 1960s, I was certainly taught about the clearances and about the home industry, the domestic industry, um, in terms of industrialisation in Scotland. But these were taught in two distinct and separate parts. So it's, it's an interesting idea that you're putting across that the clearances should be seen um, throughout sort of Scotland, really. But can I just clarify, um, it is the case still, the view is still, that these, the clearances in the Highlands were uh, mainly compulsory evictions um, where people had little choice um, and were driven off, off the land and hence many people emigrating or trying to eke out an existence in other parts of Scotland. But I'm mean, still of the belief that it's still correct to think in terms of the clearances that you're referring to in uh, lowland Scotland. It was very m is it still the case that it was the choice that people did work at home at the time of the beginning of machinery and industrialisation? But is it that people still had a choice to leave the rural areas and move into the towns well, because I mean, they thought that there were um, the possibility of better conditions um, or there was more, they would eke out a living in a better way? Or is that, is it that the industrialists um, somehow pulled the people? I, I, I don't understand that yeah. bit. So well, it's, 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 it's right. The, um, it's very, very difficult to summarise important elements of a 500-page book. But, um, but uh, that's one of the reasons why I suggested that there's one way of dealing with that problem <laughs> at the beginning. Um, but the, the point I would, I would make to you is this, that the, the Gale had considerable knowledge of opportunities uh, elsewhere in Scotland. Because one of the phenomena that kept people um, uh, alive, really, after the decline of so many of the by employments like kelping, illicit whiskey making, and eventually also military employment after 1815 20, was the combination of potato cultivation, some grain cultivation, sending the odd, um, the odd uh, cow south in the, the droves uh, to, to the south, um, but, but above all, temporary migration. That is, sending the young south for the harvest, but not simply that because the migration became temporary. They would go sometimes for four, five, six months in the year. One of the key sources for the book is the census enumerator's returns. Not the actual official census, but the notebooks taken or used by those who went round the places, as they still do to this day. Uh, so there's 96 of these um, uh, parishes, uh, if, if you like, uh, uh, which, uh, which I've looked at, or myself and my research assistants looked at for the censuses of 1841, 51 and 61. And, and in the notes alongside the numbers, they will tell you in, in great detail and specifically those who are not there on census day because they're elsewhere working in the south or in the fisheries or whatever. Um, but the most significant point of all I would like to make, well, that's, that sounds over modest. Um, sorry, that sounds immodest. The, 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 a key point I would like to make to you is, and again, I worried um, uh, away at this to try and get an explanation of it. The population of the four Highland counties rose throughout the classical period of clearance. Now, if this was a tutorial, which it isn't, 
I'd be pinning you against the wall saying, okay, um, you've done your reading. How do you explain that? How, what's the explanation for that, that clearance apparently means depopulation? And yet there was much more emigration and mi out migration after 1861 than there was during the classic period of clearance between the 1790s and the 1840s and 18, 18, uh, sorry, 18, late 1840s and into the early, early 1850s. There is an attempted answer in the book, but it brings into focus the fact that there is a considerable distinction, ladies and gentlemen, between the scholar's uh, analysis of the evidence and the beliefs. Obviously, you know, we are professionals. This is my trade. And in the same way as with a joiner or a plumber, you get to know the, the detail, the inside stories of the thing. Um, and it's fascinating. I one reviewer actually, I think it was in the Herald newspaper, said, okay, a lot of the mythology is corrected or um, challenged, but the end result of what, what um, Tom Devine comes out with is actually, in a sense, at least as dramatic as the old stories. And that, that, is, that, that was a fantastic thing for that reviewer to say, because that's exactly the way I feel about what has been discovered as a consequence of looking at this, this huge subject, um, which is so much at the heart almost of a sense of Scottish identity. So it's been a privilege working on it and will almost certainly be as a result of complete intellectual exhaustion. <laughs> my, my penultimate, <laughs> my, my penultimate book. <laughs> Penultimate, I maybe, know, maybe, maybe. Yes, I <laughs> can I say we are, we are going to come to an end shortly? We, we started late, so I'll just let it run on a little bit. But I can't. I'm afraid other uh, events are on the building, uh, including here. We've got two uh, contributors up in the cheap seats. Um, if we can <laughs> just get sorry, just totally cheap, cheap joke the gods, there. The gods. Yes, the gods. Actually, before I let you, in, can I just uh, also comment on this? We've had a contributor here uh, on social media saying. Um, People were cleared from the land, but actually they weren't allowed to emigrate. There was an act of parliament there was, that's which, true. which stopped them emigrating. Yeah, yeah. So. This is the other aspect to this story, Ken. The, the, um, the, the detailed analysis of what clearance was, and obviously since we're having a broad discussion, we don't want to, want to go into definition about it, but it varies enormously from place to place. Uh, there are at least 15 cogent reasons why people were cleared or evicted or moved as I again try to analyze in the volume. And at the same time, it varied over time. So this, uh, this gentleman on social media is referring to a time when the landlords were totally opposed to out-migration, which was the case until about 1815, 1820, when they have what they call a redundant population and they want rid of them. But during the earlier period, they practiced a kind, what I would call a kind of duality. Um, they would lease the interior glens to sheep farming and sometimes cattle ranching. People would be moved to the coast where they would be settled in crofts. The croft was, and this was well thought out uh, in terms of the literature of the time, the croft would be cut to such a level, cut to such a, sh a size, that the people could not gain an entire annual subsistence from it. They had to work in fishing, or kelp gathering and burning, and a few other activities, including, including uh, military employment uh, that Stanner referred to, Stanner referred to earlier. Um, uh, so so that, um, that, that uh, was a way to earn two sources of profit. First of all, from commercial pastoralism, but keep the people on the land, which was the case down to about the 1815, 1820, 1825 period, and exact profit from their labour power. Do us, young ladies there, and then the gentleman there. Uh, can you hear me here? We can hear you, yes. Oh, uh, good evening. Um, earlier you talked about sort of inevitable economic forces as it being the cause of the clearances a little bit. It seems odd to sort of avoid the issue of agency and choice and attribute to this force kind of beyond human agency and jurisdiction. Um, I mean, Stanley, yourself, you talked about um, the luxury trap and bankruptcy. Could you explain the issue of culpability a bit more in terms of landlord and the clearances? Sorry, no, I yes. Didn't get that. Well, the, the question is, and if you could pass the microphone to the 
the gentleman up at the back there, you got one. The, the, the question is really that we, we, we're talking about the difference between choice and compulsion. Yes. But actually, the, in a time of changing economic factors, mm -hmm. um, it's really more about agency and, and culpability. In other words, they may have a choice on paper, but they don't really have any choice and they don't have any agency in this. It's, it's, and therefore, the no, people no. are still guilty. The, 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 oh, no, no, I mean, there, there, there's two things there. I totally agree with what the implied, implied point in the question, uh, namely the people had, uh, in certain terms of, of remaining in possession of land, they had no choice whatsoever. Uh, one of the other major sources in the book is the so-called summons of removal, uh, which is the legal document compelling the tenant um, uh, to remove, usually at Whitson, because the argument was that was a more benign period um, uh, 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 when the weather was theoretically becoming a bit better, rather than to do it at Martinmas. Um, so in other words, removal in the spring period, uh, compelling the tenant, his entire family, his cotters, his servants, any associates, kindred, for example, who had cut up part of the, the holding and used it um, uh, you know, during a kind of process of, su of subdivision. And one of the reasons we know about clearance is because of these events where people uh, where people uh, resisted the summons and therefore the sheriff officers were brought in, the police and occasionally also um, the armed force of the state. Uh, but overwhelmingly, I would go so far as to pick a figure out of the air and say 96-97%, certainly in the lowlands but even in the Scottish Highlands, it uh, took place peacefully. The people realized the power, the power of the state. They had no leverage. They had to go. Um, and really, you could argue, therefore, that protesting would simply have made matters worse because it would have extracted the wage earning males from the family unit because they'd be, as Gordon Jackson, formerly of this house, mm -hmm. MSP, used to refer to, I'm off to the jail, Tom. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, he's a QC. Um, so he wasn't saying he was going to jail, he was simply saying he was going to interview, you know, uh, clients in the jail. So there was the sense that um, they would have been found unambiguously guilty if they, if they deforced um, the sheriff officers, if they refused the edict of the summons. And that's one of the reasons why, although there was protest in the Highlands and hardly any at all in the Lowlands, because people were prudent enough to realise it would be counterproductive. Mm. So yes, the, 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 the whole, the whole uh, setup of economy uh, outside people's control, the power of those who owned the land, uh, rather than those who actually were given temporary possession of it, was such that their agency was very limited. But it was not non-existent, because if you go back to that earlier period, when it's... Uh, the person on social media said the landowners tried to prevent emigration. We know from that period that a lot of the emigration that occurred before the, the, the beginnings of destitution in the 1820s, 30s and 40s, serious destitution, when people simply didn't have the resources really to move to the same degree. In that late 18th century period, there was much collective movement. The gentleman talked earlier on about communities to Canada. That was the period when that type of immigration was at its height. Um, it was a form of almost collective self-help, and it was community, community movement. Regrettably, what happened after 1815-20 was very much more individualized uh, and very much more uh, out with the control of the people. In fact, it became known by the 1840s, 1850s as compulsory immigration. They faced the bleak choice of eviction or eviction plus assisted transportation across the Atlantic or eventually by the mid-1850s to Australia. Tom, um, I'm, I'm conscious that yes. uh, we're going to come to the end. Now, very last comment from the gentleman at the back. Yeah, I, I haven't yet had the, the benefit of reading the book, but one, one of the aspects in, in terms of, if you look at it from a, a, a global perspective, there were a lot of things going on in the 18th, 19th century, which basically was, if you want to interpret it, as uh, the modern world. Mm. And the modern world was uh, imposing on the, the old world 
uh, different ways of doing things. And th mm. this happened certainly in the UK, but it happened all over the place. Correct. And you could argue that, that uh, shall we say, the, 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 the Gaelic culture or the Highland culture was very much of the old world, so it was more spiritually based. It, it wasn't mm. related to an economic definition of uh, how, how you should lead your life. Uh, and, and, uh, and I just wondered whether this, this was an aspect that was, was covered in the sense that uh, the, the impact of the modern world on Scotland in the 18th and 19th century was in, in a way, uh, shall we say, overturning uh, millennia of the way that people lived and looked at the world. Yes. I think that very much is before to bring in Tom Stanner. Can I just ask for your comments? Oh, yes. I mean, um, the, the Gallic culture became commodified, and that is part of the modern world. So um, outsiders, people like Pennant or Johnson, visited the Highlands as tourists. And you start to see the beginning of the modern tourist industry in the Highlands and the building up of um, the, uh, tour guides and armchair tourists and collecting of songs. And it, it's kind of transformed into another kind of cultural experience. But it's an experience that's divorced, perhaps, from some of the traditions. Um, so it's not as though it's sort of cast in aspect. It, it is changing, but the change is incorporating other... It becomes music. But, you know, Mendelssohn visits the Highlands. It becomes poetry. But it's the romantic poets. It's uh, William Wordsworth who writes about the solitary Highland lass. Um, so that culture is part of the modern world, but it's part of the modern world that sets up a dissonance with those who have that as part of their native culture. Okay, thank you. Can Tom, yes, you mean? Yeah, I mean, un undeniably, uh, uh, in terms of what you're saying, the, thing, the first thing to remember is uh, this, these processes were inaugurated in this country, that is, in England and Scotland. Um, the systems that were created, especially on land, were almost unique in this period. Uh, certainly in the 18th and early 19th centuries to Scotland and England. So they were the path breaking, especially in rural society, they were the path breakers of the route to what, you, what we would now call modernity. In other words, what we saw in this period was nothing less than the fragmentation of the old world of tribalism, uh, if you want to refer to clanship in that sense, of tribalism and subsistence living, present subsistence living, with a foothold on the land. And what, what was in place by the end of the period, certainly in Scotland by the 1840s, 1850s, though not in many other parts of Europe, it has to be said, was the triumph of market capitalism. Tom, Stana, I have to say I've got a thousand more questions, including I was going to ask you all these political questions on the agenda today, but uh, we haven't had a chance. However, as I'm sure you are uh, not unaware Sir Tom is going to be available for book signing down in the, in the lobby immediately after us. So, and there are various other events still to go on this evening and also tomorrow, so please join us. Can I say thank you very much to you for your time. Thank you to Stan and Sir Tom Devine. <laughs>